Thank you so much for joining us for our second annual Spring Birds in Maine Lunch and Learn. Whether you are a veteran birder or a new convert, this has been a banner year for backyard bird watching. We are delighted to welcome Judy Camuso, Commissioner of Maine's Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, to talk with us about Maine's spring birds, how to attract them to our yards, how to identify them, and how climate change is impacting what birds we're seeing and when. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today's event. We will hear from the commissioner first and then tackle questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though. You can send questions to me, Kathleen, at any time through the chat whenever they occur to you. Uh, you can find that chat by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen. I'll keep track of questions to ask during the Q&A session at the end. And some of you have already sent in questions via email, just so you know, I've got those. Thank you for getting a jump on things. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can reach out to Will Sedlak through the chat and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and we'll share the video later this afternoon. We'll also post it on the website where you can find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns. Thank you again for joining us and Commissioner, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much Kathleen and Will for inviting me and for everyone else for joining today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully it works. Okay, so everyone can see that hopefully Kathleen, yeah, great, all right. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining today. I'm going to start my timer so that I don't talk too, too long. Um, and so I think the, <laughs> the, the, all the things that I um, were, were kind of listed in the title of what I would talk about could each be a couple days worth of um, presentation. So I'm going to, because we only have 25 or so minutes, I'm going to go through this. Um, and, but certainly if folks have questions, if I don't hit on something you wanted to, uh, where am I on this? There we go. Uh, if, if I don't hit on something that you, you uh, want the answer to, feel free to give me a shout out either in the chat or after. Um, again, I'm Judy Camuso. I'm the commissioner of Maine Fish and Wildlife. I am an avid uh, angler and I hunt quite a bit, uh, but I think Mostly people know me for my passion for birds, so I'm pretty happy to be talking today uh, about one of my favorite things. And um, one too far here. So what is it about birds that I think are so amazing and why they are so appealing to so many people? So, for me, at least, um, birding is a great way to get outside. You can go birding every single day of the year, everywhere you are, so, and in any weather condition. So it doesn't matter if you're in New York City, Montana, Wyoming, coast of Maine, up in the mountains, there are birds everywhere uh, on this country, in this country and in the world. And so for me, it's a great motivation to get outside. Um, you don't have to be good at it. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have a lot of experience and you don't need a lot of equipment. Um, you basically, you need a, probably a pair of binoculars uh, and if folks want tips on, you know, good binoculars, I can do that at the end um, and a field guide. And most of the field guides nowadays, you can get right an app right on your phone. So you don't even really need to carry much with you. I keep my binoculars with me at all times and uh, I use them, my family makes fun of me because I go to all kinds of events and they're like, oh, she's got her binoculars again. <laughs> but I use them all the time. There's always something interesting to see. And by and large, birding is free. 
So you usually, I mean, on occasion, you might have to pay for access to some place, but most of the time, every place you go, um, you can have access to the birds in that area. So uh, is one of my favorite activities. I also really love bird behavior, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So a couple things to keep in mind are places to go, where to go. Uh, and as I just mentioned, you can go virtually anywhere. Um, but it is kind of nice to go someplace where there are known to be good numbers of birds. And so the department just completed this interactive mapper, sort of a storyboard, if you will, of places to go in the state that the department owns. And you can go and you can sort by region and kind of narrow down the scope of where you want to be. You can click on this particular dot or the management area and it will talk about the where to park, how to access it, how to get the directions, what birds you're likely to see, and the habitats that are there. So it's a really good um, overview for folks that are new, maybe want to get out into places nearby where they live. And some of my favorite spots I thought I would just highlight, particularly in the spring, Scarborough Marsh is for sure one of my favorite spots pretty well year round. Uh, but in the spring in particular, because lots of the birds coming back in the spring, some of the first birds that come back are kind of the larger wading birds. And so they'll often come back to Scarborough Marsh. And, um, you know, even as early as, as mid-March, you can start seeing ibis and egrets and red-winged blackbirds back. And it's a wonderful way to kind of, we get kind of ready, geared up for spring. It's the largest salt marsh in the state, contiguous salt marsh in the state. Um, and has great access across the Eastern Trail um, for both biking and walking. Um, and there's also access for canoes as well from a couple different spots there. Um, Kennebunk Plains, I like for a very different reason. Kennebunk Plains has a suite of very unique bird species there and that will start to pick up uh, in a couple weeks still. It's a little bit early for Kennebunk Plains, but Kennebunk Plains are sampling grasslands, one of the largest sampling grasslands in the state, which is a pretty unusual habitat for Maine. As such, it supports things like upland sandpiper, um, grasshopper sparrow, vesper sparrow, field sparrow, bobolinks, meadowlarks, shrike, I mean, uh, kestrels, um, whippoorwills breed there. So Kennebunk Plains is a kind of a premier birding spot. If you were gonna do a big day in the state, at least in the southern half of the state, you, you would for sure stop at Kennebunk Plains because it is one of the best kind of concentrations of a large suite of birds, a large number of species that you can see in a small area. Um, Brownfield Bog, also another state-owned property, um, but a wildlife management area over in the Freiburg Brownfield area. And it's probably my favorite place in, in all of Southern Maine to go visit for a couple of reasons. One, the birding is awesome. There's tons of really good stuff there. like yellow-throated vireo, uh, black and yellow-billed cuckoos, whole suite of warblers, but it's also only 45 minutes from Portland and it's like being in the wilderness. You can paddle the paddle the old course of the Saco. It's just a beautiful, beautiful place. It's a great destination. Um, and once you get on the water, the bugs aren't as bad as everybody talked about at Brownfield. It's kind of known for being a little buggy, but on the water, it's not bad at all. And then locally for me, I live in Freeport, so I think it's important to have your local patch, a place that you frequent regularly. So for me, Florida Lake's right down the road. In the spring, I'll take uh, my dog and we'll go probably three or four times a week in the morning or for a quick walk after work um, and just sort of connect. And you know, when you have that regular spot that you go to over and over again, you really become familiar with both the location, but also the species that are there. And then if something is different, you're like, hey, wait, what's that? That doesn't sound the same. I haven't heard that before. And that prompts you to kind of help learn new things as you go. So those are some of my favorite places. I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite things about birding or birds in general is their behavior. And birds, of course, let us watch these behaviors. So spring is this, that is like the penultimate time of year to watch bird behavior because everybody's breeding and they're kind of, uh, they're wanting to mate, so they're on, on display. Um, many waterfowl, but merganders in particular, have a fantastic display routine where the males will swim, 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 and then they sort of cock their head all the way to the back. And it, it doesn't really seem like physiologically they should be able to do that. It's like their head hits all the way back and then they 
propel themselves forward is fabulous this way. <laughs> and the females just like swimming around, like whatever, <laughs> keep going, do your thing. Um, it, it, but it's wonderful to watch. I love watching a uh, waterfowl display in almost any freshwater area. You can see them doing that right now. Um, woodcock, probably everybody's seen and heard woodcocks do their sort of spiral, dis spiral display. They sort of pink, 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 and then they do this spiral up and they have this adaptation and the noise you hear is actually from an adaptation on their feather um, when they're uh, flying around it makes a sort of whirring sound it's a it's an amazing spot uh, a sight to see and they will land literally on the same spot over and over and over again so once you hone in on them um, displaying you can get out and you can actually get a little bit closer and it usually this happens at dusk though so you need to be out uh, in the evenings and then of course wild turkeys probably one of the less attractive birds out there. But really when they are on display, they are really beautiful. And they have this amazing ability to fan their tail out and they kind of strut around, but they actually can shimmy all of their feathers. So they do this little like whole body shake, um, which is pretty cool to watch. So those are some of the things I just really like watching um, bird behavior and watching birds kind of do their thing. So what's kind of attractive or appealing right now is lots of birds that migrated south for the winter are now making their way back north. And so we're kind of known for, spring's known for a few groups of birds coming back. Warblers being at least one of my favorites. That's so sweet, we've got about 22, 25 species of warblers um, that either breed in the state or make their way through um, to their breeding grounds a little further north. So um, this time of year, up until about mid-May, you can see a whole, whole different array of warblers every day as they make their way back through. This is a chestnut side of warbler here. Um, lots of these birds will stay and breed locally and then some of them will go on further north up to the boreal forest and maybe into the southern part of Canada. But the other nice thing we have sometimes in the spring as well is birds do overshoot so they kind of migrate too far and so then you get some southern birds say like a bathonotary warbler that just went a little bit too far and it'll stick around for a few days, feed, fatten up and then move back south. So spring and, and warblers are really very colorful. They're sort of our tropical birds, if you will. Um, and they sing, they make noise, so they're easy to kind of find. Um, sparrows are maybe a little bit less flashy, but um, still pretty amazing to see and hear. And um, this guy here, Song Sparrow, uh, they get a, their name because they just, Sing like 27 different variations of the same song. They really, that's that cheery, happy, happy, joy, joy song that you hear um, this time of year. So um, there's lots of uh, sparrows making their way through. Sparrows typically like uh, more kind of shrubby or uh, like open, like lower, lower down. You usually find sparrows kind of lower down to the ground. Warblers are usually high up, higher up in the trees. Um, and then wading birds, of course, are long-legged birds, egrets, herons, um, come back nice and early to the state. They're very beautiful. They're breeding birds. The plumes that they have on their necks, of course, are exquisite and were part of the original reason that many of them uh, were, you know, declining or, or were almost extirpated from the state. People used to collect those feathers for hats and uh, adornment on their clothing. Um, but so wading birds are another really nice suite of birds that make their way back in the spring. And soon we'll start having more shorebirds. There's some shorebirds coming through now, but um, the majority of those are still going to make their way through. The spring is a quick, quick movement for them through the state. They don't linger too long in the spring. So the shorebirds that are coming through make their way up to their breeding grounds. Uh, uh, most of them, anyway, so a couple of them breed here in Maine, but most of them will make their way to the breeding grounds up in the tundra where they will breed and they do this amazing feat where they breed. Um, the, the parents will sit on the nest or the, they'll take turns on the nest and the eggs will hatch within, within a probably less than a month. And within a week or so of the eggs hatching, the adults leave them up on their breeding grounds. The adults migrate south ahead of the, the young of the year and then the young make their way uh, a couple weeks later after they fattened up. So the fall migration is much more protracted for shorebirds. And then of course, many of our birds of prey have made their way back and are actually setting up their territories now. Eagles and ospreys are already on nests. Rap, I mean, and, and little falcons like, falcons like this kestrel here are checking out their nest boxes um, and getting actually pretty close to breeding. 
So the economic impact of birding in the country is pretty phenomenal. It's pretty impressive, really, or $80 billion uh, economic impact just from birding in the country. And here in Maine, we have four seasons of great birding for the year, looking at waterfowl, songbirds, game birds, um, or our, our winter visitors as well. It's just a great, great state to live in if you like birds. So some of the conservation challenges, and these are not small, um, and some of the issues with climate change. Climate change, of course, is the largest uh, challenge we will face as, as a nation. Um, habitat degradation, so migration and stopover. So there's a couple issues here going on, both with changes in development patterns during migrate or on migration and stopover sites, as well as um, shifting territory. So climate's changing, so some birds are kind of migrating and their, their overall range is shifting. So a little bit more northward, uh, I think a good example of that would be red-bellied woodpecker. Folks have started seeing red-bellied woodpeckers much more regularly year round in the state. Even just 25 years ago, tufted titmouse really wasn't here in the same, um, you know, sort of regular everyday bird as they are now. Um, and then one of the things that really, I think is a little bit concerning for us is uh, food availability. So the, particularly birds that are migrating south, when they come back, their migration is timed to take advantage of the food that is available. So they usually come back before the leaves are out on the trees and the, the warblers in particular will move around. You'll watch them eating the bugs off the trees. And so there's some worry that if bird, if trees start leafing out sooner because climate's changing, then um, when the birds come back, there is not going to be those foods available to them. Now, the, the upside to that or, or a counter to that is that the, the birds could move sooner. And we have seen birds starting to migrate, uh, move back to the state sooner. So this is, these are some of the things, the unknowns. We don't know what's going to, how it's going to play out. Um, but a lot of the birds that we're seeing come back now, even when I worked at Audubon, you know, 20 years ago, um, they're a full two two weeks earlier on average than they were back then. So, and that, that's sort of anecdotal, my own personal information, but I have looked at some of the phenology reports from uh, like Joni Dupree and others, and there have definitely been a good number of birds that have sort of shifted um, their, their average return date has gotten a little bit sooner. So I do like to talk about positive stories and there are plenty of them. There are lots of challenges in conservation, but there's also lots of success stories. And um, you know, I think everybody can really take a hand of a round of applause for the recovery of bald eagles in the state. Uh, in 1967, we only had 21 nesting pairs. And in 2018, we had 434 nesting pairs. It's pretty amazing. Um, and of course with eagles, you know, they don't breed until they're four or five years old. So 734 nesting pairs, there's still a lot of younger birds that aren't breeding in the state. So um, there's literally not a day that goes by that I do not see a bald eagle uh, somewhere in my travels. Um, turkeys, another really good success story, maybe even too successful, some would argue. Um, they were completely extirpated from the state. And in the 1970s, the department worked with partners to try and repopulate them. We uh, transferred some individuals from Vermont to Maine. And um, now in 2020, I would say we have a population that is maybe <laughs> overpopulated in many areas, as I hear about from uh, landowners and farmers on a pretty regular basis. Um, but overall, a, a very positive story. It's not too often that we hear that story. Piping plover is another really good example of an endangered species that was on the brink of extirpation from the state uh, in 2011. Only had 33 pairs of piping plovers back in probably the late 90s. We were down to like seven pairs. Um, and in 2020, we had a new record of 98 breeding pairs with an all time high number of uh, chicks produced. So, some really positive stories. So, and a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight about the department's working on, we have a whole bunch of bird programs. I, I don't know that everybody's always 
aware or as aware as I want them to be of all the various bird projects that the department is working on at any given time. But um, right now we have a really exciting project going on. This is one of the larger projects the state's undertaken in a long time. Uh, and so this is a five year uh, atlas, a bird atlas, which will basically document all the birds breeding in the state. Unlike this, this was done once before in the late seventies, hasn't been done since. Um, and for this round, we are also doing a winter component to try and document how many birds are wintering here in the state. So the bird atlas, which what I, what I really like about it is that it is open to everybody. It is a volunteer program. We have um, volunteers all over the state, regional coordinators helping uh, organize volunteers in their region and looking at um, breeding birds over the, the five year period. And then likewise, same, same sort of thing in the winter time, trying to document birds in, in the winter as well. So it is a really comprehensive look at the birds that are using uh, Maine either as winter or, or summer habitat, um, but also what will then sort of set a baseline so that we can do these analyses as we go on and monitor things like um, population range changes, if, if population's expanding, if it's contracting, all those things that we use to uh, help guide management decisions as we move forward with uh, various programs. Oops. So how can you help Maine's birds? Um, funding is always an issue and I will talk a little bit about a funding opportunity coming up here um, before we end, but um, we have a program beginning with Habitat that's designed specifically to help towns, municipalities, regional planning groups look at Habitat options um, for areas to kind of direct development in areas where a town or municipality might say, hey, this is really more of a, a great location for open space or for a park or for a management area, anything like that. Um, so engage with your town and participate in how your uh, community is, is developed moving forward. Um, we have a chickadee checkoff that is on your tax, your annual tax checkoff. That is a contribution that goes directly to our non-game and endangered program to help fund all of our bird uh, initiatives. So I, I should say like that, that bird atlas is a $2 million project. <laughs> Uh, so it's a substantial and it's entirely federally funded. Um, and so we do have to provide state match. So the chickadee checkoff uh, is a great way to help with that match. Likewise, the balloon um, conservation plate is another great way. Um, participate in the bird atlas. It's open for everybody. You don't have to be a great or skilled birder. We've got Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts participating. Um, and it, it is available for school groups, anybody that wants to participate. Um, can in, engage in the bird atlas. And we also have these really cool birder bands that you could buy for $20 and put on your binoculars or your spotting scope or your pocketbook, whatever you want. Um, and it goes, that money goes again directly to support your, um, your state's bird programs. Um, and if you are feeding birds, make sure you keep them clean um, to prevent the spread of disease. So I did also want to talk just a little bit about I'm uh, on the I am the chair of the North American Bird Conservation Initiative and uh, the co-chair of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Bird Conservation Committee. And as such, we work on issues to try and work nationally on bird conservation initiatives. And I think everybody has probably by now seen the the, um, the loss of three million birds, three billion birds since 1970. Uh, so one, one in four birds have disappeared from the country. Um, and so some of the things that this initiative works to do is to try and change that paradigm. And so um, there's a road to recovery with, with have five kind of game changing ways to do it. But one of the real important things for me is, in particular in my role as commissioner, um, is to try and, you know, I think it's fair to say what we've been doing to date isn't going to get us to where we need to be in the future. So we need to, there needs to be some changes, both in behavior, but also how we reach out and who we work with. And so I personally believe that 
um, people will protect what they love. And so the more people that love birds, the more people they're gonna try and protect them uh, and work to promote bird conservation in their area. So we are working really hard to try and diversify who participates in birding and outdoor activities in general, reaching out to broader groups, newer audiences. There's a, actually a field guide for developing partners. And so we're all pretty good at working with people that are like-minded um, and have similar backgrounds, but we're not as good at working with people who are different. And if we're going to make a difference, then we need to start uh, having hearing from different audiences, reaching out to different groups, including those people, making sure they feel invited, welcome, and um, equal in in those activities. And you know, I I I think we all saw during COVID the number of people participating in the outdoor activities has just skyrocketed. And it's our jobs to make sure that they those people stay doing outdoor things that they have a good experience, that it's positive, that they feel safe and welcome, and they want to keep doing it. Um, so um, this is a, just an initiative to try and uh, cement that approach kind of on a national basis and um, get more states actively trying to reach out to broader groups of people. Um, and of course, when the birds benefit, then everything benefits. When you've got healthy bird populations in your backyard, then you've got a lot of other things that are benefiting from that as well. So, and the last thing I want to point out, um, yesterday, I think yesterday, Earth Day, was that yesterday? I think. Um, for the first time, we have a really unique opportunity. Um, Recovering America's Wildlife Act is a bill that has been uh, in the works for quite a few years. Before, uh, before the previous administration. It is an effort to try and fund states work on non-game species or species of greatest conservation needs. So each state has a, a state wildlife action plan um, that they are required to map out how they're going to try and basically prevent things from being listed, keep populations either stable or in increasing. Um, but there's very limited funding for that. And so this bill would basically dedicate $1.5 billion annually in permanent funding to be directed to the states for protection or work on the state's species of greatest conservation needs, which is a is a enormous shift in how the states would do business. Um, and it would open up a uh, tremendous opportunity for bird conservation and wildlife conservation in the state. So it was introduced on the House yesterday. Uh, Shelley, uh, Congresswoman Pingree is one of the co-sponsors. I do believe our entire federal delegation is on board with this bill, but certainly um, I think any opportunity you have to express your support of RAWA as it's known, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, um, would be a tremendous help. And uh, I think we actually have a chance at getting this bill passed. It's gotta go through the House, comes out to the House, it'll go over to the Senate, and then it get, has to get uh, voted on by both parties, or by both um, the House and the Senate before it can move on. So I encourage everybody, please, if you can reach out to your delegation and um, encourage them to support this very important bit of legislation. And so um, that's all I have. I think I, I didn't go too far over. Um, and again, if you don't know about my agency, we are um, here to promote and manage the state's fish and wildlife and responsibly connect people to the outdoors, food, recreation, sport, and science. And I am happy to answer any questions. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. See you Thank bit. you so much, Commissioner. That was just Fabulous. You know, we have um, a really big crowd on the call today, and that was true when we did Spring Birds last year as well. I know there's just so much interest um, from, from amateurs like me to folks who have spent a lot more time and know a lot more about birds. So thank you for sharing so much. Um, just so everybody knows that a couple of the links that the commissioner talked about are 
we'll, we'll share this afternoon in that follow-up email. So if you didn't didn't grab them out of the chat, don't worry. Uh, we will share share all of that, including the map and the bird atlas um, and that three billion birds site as well with the simple actions to help. Uh, thank you so much. And we've got a, a whole bunch of questions, so we're going to dive right in. We've seen Phoebes nesting under the eave of our deck for at least five years now. Mm -hmm. Are they likely to be the same pair? Mm, yeah, probably. Or or they're young, so they'll they'll uh, the parents, you know, will come back if they're successful. The birds will likely come back year after year, but they're not that long a lived a species. So after five years, you would think that it's probably uh, perhaps one of the offspring, and so. Um, the young generally come back to the same area that they were hatched from. So um, if it's not the same pair, it maybe is, um, you know, an, a different female or a different male or, or whatever the case may be. But, uh, you know, after, you know, four or five years, it's probably going to start to be uh, an offspring or the family tradition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And should we leave nests that we see, you know, over the winter so that will will spring birds return to those or are we better off clearing the, the way for a new home? So do you mean uh, like a nest that's on your house, like a Phoebe nest or something like that? Yeah, or tucked into the, the deck yeah. footings or anything like that. So, it you know, there's um, a couple things. One, it, it's you know, if you have got like birdhouses out and stuff like that, definitely it's best to clean those out. Um, for something like a Phoebe, Phoebe nest, it probably doesn't, um, it probably doesn't matter necessarily. They'll probably add on to it in, you know, when they're uh, making a new nest. But um, if it's in a spot that's not ideal for you, then I, I would say go ahead and, and move it. Um, but most of the time you do want the birds to build a new nest because sometimes there's just like residual things in the nest that aren't necessarily hygienic for the next year. So it's most of the time you, it's fine to go ahead and take that nest down. Having said that, you cannot keep the nest. Um, so the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act protects birds, their nests, and their eggs. So you can't have any part of them. You can't have a feather, but you can't, I mean, it's pretty as some of them are. and um, you can't, you can't, if you find a nice little tight, beautiful little, say, yellow warbler nest, you can't, you technically can't bring that inside and say, keep it. Um, but, um, so where should, what should we do the with wild them then? Be. Yeah. What's that? Just, what, what should we do with them then? After, after we admire that incredible construction, just toss yeah, them in yeah, the woods? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned cleaning birdhouses. Um, and there are also a few questions about cleaning feeders. Mm, this yeah. is something, you know, I think a lot of us worry that we're not doing right and maybe we don't do at all, <laughs> but right. that's not the solution. What is, what should we be doing? Yeah, if you're feeding birds, you definitely should be cleaning the feeders. And I use a one part like bleach to 10 parts water. So a dilute uh, solution, bring it in, clean it out. And then you have to be sure to let it dry thoroughly. So um, let it dry out and then uh, before you put it back out. Because if it's not dry, then the seeds might tend to get like mildewed. So um, make sure that you dry it thoroughly before you put it back out. And I know a lot of people, there's a lot of folks that stop feeding during the summer. Um, and, you know, because there's lots of other natural food supplies out there. And um, I, as, as long as you don't have problems with other wildlife getting into the particularly say black bears in parts of the state do really like bird feeders. So as long as you don't have black bears, I would say at least keep it up, um, you know, through mid-May in that a lot of the bugs aren't really active yet till mid-May. So there's not a ton of food available. So there's not really any seeds available yet and the, you know, berries and stuff aren't quite out uh, until later. So if you're gonna take the feeder down for the summer, go ahead and I say leave it up till um, mid-May. And then, you know, uh, certainly you can switch over and add things like Orioles, like uh, oranges for Orioles and hummingbird feeders, things like that. 
All right, I know they're not the threat that black bears might be to feeders, but squirrels, <laughs> oh my goodness. What do we do about the squirrels? Uh, I know, they're the bane of everyone's bird feeding existence. Um, you mean, there are some, you know, baffles that you can use. So, you know, you, you gotta figure out how the, the squirrel's accessing the feeder. Is it coming down from a tree or, um, you know, the, the wire, or is it coming up from below? And they'll try, they'll do both. And they're so persistent. Um, so the only things that I've found that are successful, people do things like they put oil, you know, they put like Vaseline or olive oil or something on the, the pole of the bird feeder. And eventually that, that stuff wears off and the squirrels stay out with that. Um, they are extremely acrobatic and, you know, can, you know, like practically fly through the air to get at that feeder. Uh, so you need to, you probably need to do put up, you do need to put up some kind of baffle. And so the, the, they sell them at the hardware store and you just kind of, it's almost like a giant, uh, like the, a lid of a garbage can almost that just physically prevents them from being able to get up or down as the case may be. So, and, and if it's on the top, it usually kind of wobbles a little bit so that they, it flips them off. They also make some that are weighted um, so that if something of a certain weight pushes down on the feeder, then the feeder closes. Now, the trouble with that, and this is because I've got one of those in my yard and what the squirrels do is they hold on from the top and then they lean down and they shovel the seeds out because they figure that out, right? So they lean down and then they push all the seeds out, then they drop down and you can it. So they're not foolproof. So you still probably, even with that weighted um, dispenser, you still probably need a baffle as well. Persistent little guys. Or you could enjoy them. That's right, that's, that's right. Fun. Make peace with it. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering a little bit about how, you talked about some of the changes that are, are affecting our birds. Mm. How about changes in Maine's rivers, given the fact that, that some are dammed, some are becoming undammed? What does that mean for birds? Sure, so, you know, un undammed, when we take the dams off, you do see more free, free flowing uh, aquatic resources. So in particular fish, and, you know, our, actually our, um, our raptor biologist, Aaron Call did her PhD on this and um, studying the, how much the dam removal affects bird populations upstream. And so, yeah, certainly it does. So once the dams are removed and the fish are moving more freely, birds like ospreys and eagles in particular, herons, all those other kind of fish eating birds move with the fish. So. Um, they certainly um, take advantage of that new open uh, system and, you know, benefit, benefit from it. There's, there's more basically biomass through the whole length of the river up to the next dam uh, when the dams are removed. So yeah, for sure. Really interesting. Yeah. We know that the uh, COVID pandemic has given a lot of us more time and, uh, and fewer distractions to get into birding, but how has it affected the, the birds? Um, we've got someone on the, the call today who was on Peaks Island during the initial lockdown and says, yeah, there are fewer people and fewer cars on the island for sure, but is it possible there were way more birds as well? <laughs> um, probably not, but what, you know, what we did see a few things. So I would say the one thing for me that birds and birding did during the pandemic was a, such a good reminder that the natural world is on the same cycle as they have been. And it was a really reassuring for me to go back and, you know, in, in hear frog singing and birds, you know, returning and, and singing almost exactly on schedule. Like the, not, like nothing, they, you know, nothing else, that nothing had changed. Um, and so, I don't think bird, you know, bird populations vary, you know, vary season annually quite a bit, depends on how, mostly how wet the spring is and, and how productive they were. But, um, and so it normally would take more than just a season or a year for us to see a long-term change in a population trend. Um, I will see that there was a lot of people that reported, you know, with fewer, vehicles on the road, there was a lot less sort of congestion and 
a lot less background noise. So it was easier to, to sort of see and connect with those things. Um, and I guess I think a lot more people got connected to birds and started paying attention and are really interested and enthusiastic about it in a way that we have not seen in a long time. And hopefully people will continue once the movie theaters open back up and the miniature golf and all the other competing interests, hopefully people will still wanna go, uh, go outside and look at birds and do those things. I know for me, it was, it was an absolute lifesaver is, is having access to the outdoors was um, what got, got me through the most stressful periods. Yeah, just cannot even count how many times I said, how lucky are we to be weathering this in Maine? Yeah, <laughs> it's been really, really special. I would have to go before, but after I went to the grocery store, I have to time it because the grocery store was so stressful with everybody in masks. And in the beginning when there was, you know, all the shelves were bare and it was just felt like it was, like overnight, like we had just entered this whole different world. And, and then I would, I would go for a walk outside and I'd be like, no, everything's going to be okay. You're going to, it's, we're going to get through this, like the, you know, yellow warbler is back in his regular spot and he's singing away. <laughs> so That's really, thank you. Yeah. Do you have any favorite spots in the Bangor Orono area? And I know, I know birders like, to protect some of their favorite spots, but if you have any you're willing to share. <laughs> so I don't actually bird a ton in that area. Um, I would say that, uh, I, and I see Ted Coffins on the call, so he can probably correct my pronunciation. The Pajajawak Marsh is a really good spot in that um, Bangor Bog Walk there. So in the Bangor City Forest, I whenever I have, when I'm, I'm in Bangor, if I've got to spend the night, I'll, uh, go to the boardwalk there, either in the morning or in the evening. Those are a couple of my favorites, not too far. I mean, there's so many areas in close proximity to Bangor, whether you pop over to Acadia um, or this is Moosehorn right there, the National Wildlife Refuge. So there's a lot of opportunities in that area. I just, I'm not up there as often. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, you mentioned that you have your binoculars with you all the time. What what kind of binoculars do you use? What should we use? What do you recommend? So I, I would say this, this is my advice to people, buy the most expensive pair of binoculars you can buy. You should only ever have to buy one pair in your life. If you buy a good pair, you'll only buy one and you won't ever need them to buy them again. Um, so, and the, the better, the higher end brands really do provide excellent customer service. If you've got a problem, they fix them for free and, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but not everybody wants to shell out a couple thousand dollars for a pair of binoculars. So um, I, I use uh, Zeiss um, and I use, so for me, I, a couple of things I want in binoculars, I don't want them to be wicked heavy because I use them a lot and my arms get tired. Um, and I want to be able to close focus. So. I have a spotting scope that I use. If I'm gonna be trying to see things from far away, then I, I use my spotting scope. So I want my binoculars to be close focusing. So I would always encourage, like I like eight power binoculars. So the first number is the magnification. The second number is the amount of light that they let in. So you always want that second number to be at least five times the first. So eight by 40. Um, and that, that way at low light, if you're out burning at dawn or dusk, you're still gonna have a good clear um, image. So having said that, there's a lot of really good binoculars in the four or $500 range. Um, Nikon makes several pairs, Bushnell makes really good ones. There's, there's lots of really good binoculars out there. You don't have to spend, you know, 18, 200, $2,000. But um, if you're really serious about it and you're gonna, is, is so something that you do all the time, you know, go to one of the, uh, like one of the spring birding festivals and very often the reps are there and they'll set up and they'll often let you borrow them for a couple hours and, and you can try them. So before you invest in something that significant, I would encourage you to try them out or try borrow someone from a, from a friend who has them um, or, you know, go to one of the shows and, and take them out and practice with them. They um, they do make a huge difference in what you can see. 
and how clearly and how frustrated you'll get because you know you the, the better you can see the birds, the better you'll be able to identify them. So they do make a big difference. Thanks. Those are really good tips. I appreciate that. Um, how about bird books and particularly things that that maybe pack a punch so that you can carry them with you when you're out in the world? Yeah. So um, there's so many good bird books out there and it's almost um, is kind of overwhelming. I would say my personal favorite, uh, I always say this, my personal favorite, and then they list like five things. Um, so I like the Sibley Guide. So what I like about the Sibley Guide is I, I prefer drawings to uh, photographs. And I think only just because the photograph is like that bird in a particular light condition, like that, just that one time, that one shot. And they don't always look that way. The, the, the light's not always the same. So I, I prefer drawings. Um, and I like the Sibley Guide also because it has the map right on the same page. So it has the range map on the same page with the drawing. It has a little bit about the bird, a little bit of background, um, not a ton, but it usually gives some of the habitat, you know, that you're likely to see this bird in a field or, you know, high up in a tree, deciduous forest, whatever. Um, so, and the Sibley Guide comes, you can buy one that's for all of North America, or you could buy just the Eastern and just the Western. Um, and if you're going to be out, and if I'm going to be out, you know, hiking, do it, I would just take the smaller one, the, the Eastern Guide to Birds. And so, <clears throat> this is my other thing is <laughs> because people always, they, you, everybody wants to see the rare bird. Everybody wants to see it. And I remind people that the most likely thing is, is it's common. So, start with the common stuff first. So there's no need to carry the Western guide with you um, if you're gonna be hiking on the AT because it's very, very unlikely. Any birds that are um, unique to the West Coast are gonna be on that trail with you. So you're, you're most likely gonna see the birds that have, you know, there's, you know, there's plenty of birds here in Maine. So, um, you know, you, you, there's plenty of, there's still plenty of confusion in that one book. So I would limit the confusion and keep just the Eastern guide with you. Um, but there's lots of other good, but, you know, of course the, you know, the Peterson guide is great and the Stokes guides are excellent. And then there's some books, if you are, you know, want to learn a little bit more, some of the behavior books that follow, um, are, are great assets and they help you understand, kind of give you a little bit more of the background to help you understand when you might see that bird, like when they're here, what they're doing. And, you know, there's things in there about, you know, like, you know, the owls preen when they're, they, they, they preen each other when they're breeding. And there's lots of other behavioral information like that. That's really interesting that I love um, the behavior guides for. That's great. Thanks. And then we're, we're in a little section of questions on, on the gear, what we need. Mm -hmm. When it comes to bird songs, is there an app or something that we can use so that, you know, record something on your phone and have it tell you what you're hearing? Yeah, so I would say the best source for bird songs and you can you can get it. The Merlin guide that the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology puts out a field guide at Merlin and it, it the, I think it's called Merlin, it, which is the app that you download. Um, and they have, it has all the songs on it and it has the songs and the calls and so you can download that. And I, I mean, I think it's $20 or something like that, but um, I don't know, there are some, I, I've lost track honestly of the, there probably are some apps out there where you can play the song and it'll identify it for you. But I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I usually do it the other Fair way. Enough. I usually go, I look up, I'm like, how oh, is that a Merlin or a Kestrel that I heard and play the song and, and figure it out that way. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, the citizen science initiative in the, the bird atlas. Is that right? Uh, one of our participants today also mentioned, uh, eBird. Yep. Are, are there, do you have a favorite sort of citizen based citizen science, community-based birding program? And do those, is there a way to integrate them all so that we're getting the data from, you know, no matter where you're logging it, it's all accessible to the folks doing research? Yeah, so <clears throat> eBird is, is um, 
a way for folks to keep track of the birds that they've been seeing. So it's a it's a website through or an app, however you want to think about it. Um, it's a database through Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So I can go in as Judy Camuso and I can see what's I can do a search and see what's been seen in my area. Or if I was going to be going to North Carolina for the weekend, I could search what birds have been seen there. Um, and then I can also keep a checklist of everything I've seen. Um, I could provide information for other people, photos, whatever you want, your map, your check, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, so, so that's kind of one thing. And it, but it's almost like your own managing your own experiences. However, um, we do work with Cornell, say, on our um, bird atlas, and we do share that they do share data with us. Now, for us, there's some a little extra caveat. So, for us to document that a bird is breeding, you have to actually see that it's carrying nest material or a fecal sac, or see, you know, so you have to put some other qualifiers on it for it to make it to our. Um, into our database for breeding, but we could, we would use the occurrence data so that we would know that the bird had been seen. So we do, part, Cornell is one of our partners for that program. Um, and so we do um, kind of share that data for sure. Um, and really <clears throat> yeah, you mentioned no, and I noticed Katie shared in the chat, Katie Yates shared in the chat, a list of all of the citizen science programs that the department manages for birds. So any folks can take a look at that. and. Um, certainly reach out to the program manager if they're interested. Fabulous, fabulous. You mentioned nesting materials there. Uh, I heard some some things about leaving your leaves on the lawn and, <laughs> and things like what, how do leaves help? How are they beneficial for, for birds? What else should we be doing as we're, we're thinking about our yards and gardens to make them bird friendly? Yeah, so I mean, there's quite a few things. So the leaves on the lawn or in your garden right now are there, um, they're going to decompose and provide additional soil, of course, but they're also right now they're harboring insects. Um, so they, they're helping the invertebrate live. And so the birds will then feed on those. So yeah, I, we encourage people to leave that as long as they can until they can tolerate it anymore and, and need to, you know, tidy up their gardens for, um, for spring. But for sure, you know, I mean, I try to encourage people to mow your lawn as little as you can. Um, did, I don't have- You don't have to tell me twice. I love like that. <laughs> you know, minimize the lawn and move more toward, you know, field or natural grasses and native plants. Those things are all gonna benefit the birds in your backyards. Um, I think, you know, when you obviously composting the leaves or any um, grass, all that kind of stuff is just good sense for the environment and the birds in your backyard, for sure. That's great. Um, and don't plant they, species. Don't plant what? <laughs> Probably that don't plant in any invasive species. A lot of them are not legal to sell anymore, but um, you know, in our state wildlife action plan, one of the, the biggest kind of challenges is the, uh, you know, rate of spread for non-native invasive species. So encourage folks to try and minimize those, uh, the use of invasive species and um, work toward a more natural scape in your backyard. Are there any, you mentioned the, the federal legislation, which is super exciting. Are there any bills that we should be watching in the, at the state legislative le level uh, that are relevant to, to birds? Uh, I don't, I can't think of anything okay. off the top of my head. Sometimes I am so overwhelmed with what's happening at the legislature. I can't keep track of them all. Um, you know, surely there's a lot of several bills related to climate. And so of course those would be very impactful for all, you know, all the wildlife in the state. And so supporting the governor's climate action plan um, is gonna be important for everybody. Um, and I think there's 20, maybe 18 or 20 bills related to climate in, but those go actually to the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources. Great. Um, I know, I know you said it's usually, it's most likely that we've seen, we're seeing common birds, but <laughs> is it possible? Always. Because I saw a few weeks ago, I saw what I think was a snow bunting. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. 
All right. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So I always tell people that it, most likely it's common. But you, I, the never and always don't exist with wildlife, in particular with birds, because they are so able to move around. And so there's been lots of very rare birds here in the state this past year. So, um, and maybe to get back to the question earlier, maybe where those birds are being documented more because more people are out, you know, and seeing them, more likely to see them with more people out on the landscape. But, but for sure, there's always... Um, exceptions to the rule and but snow buntings would be one a bird that you could definitely see in the state this time of year usually they're kind of a low flying like a uh, snow bunting um, they have like a little undulating flight over a field and in open areas or even at the beach like at Popham or Reed would be a good place to see uh, buntings. Okay. And uh, what do we do about birds that are hogging all the bird seed in our feeders. We've got some pieces, there are 30 plus blue jays that are just taking more than their fair share. Yeah, yeah, they're pigs. Um, you can, you can, you can get the weighted feeders as well for in, in time and set that little uh, weight bar so that the blue jay is actually too heavy. Um, some people put like grates over the feeders to keep the, I don't like those because sometimes small birds get stuck in those, but um, by and large, you know, you can think about the feed that you use and um, blue jays really like mealworms, so don't offer those. Um, they, oh no, but they, they're also attracting yeah, the bluebirds, right? Love, yeah, bluebirds love them. Everybody loves them. It's like okay. a bundle of fat. Um, you know, they're not as good at perching on a cylindrical, uh, like a that I'm not saying they can't do it, but they're not as good at the long fin feeders with the smaller uh, port just because they're bigger. So they had to like crouch down. So they're, they're much more likely to come into like a tray style feeder or a feeder with a long perch where they can, they can fit a little bit better. So some of the style feeder might help minimize, but you know, I mean, they are kind of obnoxious and that, but they're so pretty. They are like the most beautiful bird and they are, I mean, they're, awesome. They're also mimics. You know, I've got a blue jay in my backyard that will mimic uh, like a red-tailed hawk or a broad wing hawk and, and he scares all the other birds out until he comes in he has free access. You know, you gotta, you gotta admire them as well, I think. <laughs> so, so experiment and make peace with it. <laughs> <laughs> More so than the squirrels. I think you have to make peace with the jays. Right, right. We could do this all day and I have a feeling that what we would really like is to have, you know, all of us going out birding together. But thank you for, for connecting over Zoom. Thanks to everybody who has joined us today. Uh, I always, we always have so many more questions than we have time for. And I'm really grateful to everybody for, for sharing those good, good questions. Uh, we will be back in this space next week for a, a little bit of a different, we're gonna go from birds to regulatory reform. It's all, all fun. <laughs> Next week, we will uh, be looking at one of the priorities of Maine's Environmental Priorities Coalition. Uh, State Rep Vicki Dudera has introduced legislation that will better align Maine's Public Utilities Commission with the state's climate action plan and with climate law. She'll be with us next week. We'll also have PUC Chair Phil Bartlett and Acadia Center's Jeff Marks. I hope you can all join us. But first, I hope you have a beautiful weekend filled with birds and sunshine and all of those good things. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thanks Thank to you. all of you. Thanks to everybody. Nice to see you all. Happy weekend. <laughs>